Hello everyone, welcome to this UK Data Service webinar on tables and pivot tables in Excel. Your speaker today will be Peter Smythe of the University of Manchester. What we're going to look at today is um, tables and pivot tables in Excel. There's a very variety of things we'll look at. So we're starting with what a table is, why we use them, and why you might want to use them, I recommend them. Tables and data validation. Uh, data validation, of course, you can do without tables, but it's a lot better with tables. Um, and we'll go through some of that. We look at creation, re creating relationships between tables um, in a very practical scenarios, rather than getting into the, the nitty gritty of set theory and all that sort of stuff. We'll just show practical examples of doing that. Uh, we'll talk about what a pivot table is. Again, not too, nothing too technical, just based on examples and why you want to use them. And at the end, if we've got time, I'll just show some pivot charts and dashboards. That's really just because pivot tables by themselves are pretty boring to look at. Um, most of the webinar is gonna be taken up with demonstrations, which means I'm gonna to have to keep switching screens, which could be problematic the way Zoom's working at the moment, but we'll see, give it a go. Um, there are a few slides set scenes and then lots of demonstrations. So let's start with what is a table in Excel. Now, if you've used Excel before, you know what screens look like, what, what worksheets look like, and so on. So you might think, well, isn't everything a table? Because it's got rows and columns. You can't not have rows and columns in Excel very easily. Yes, they've got rows. Yes, they've got columns. But in reality, it really, they are really just collections of individual cells. They just look like a table because of the way they're arranged and you you conveniently give uh, columns, titles and things like that. Individually though, there are individual cells, A1, B1, C1 and so on. So things that we're gonna start looking at in the demo, I'm just gonna show you the slides first and then we'll get into the demo. So how to create a table? Well, you gotta start with some data. Now you can either import the data or you can have it put in manually. And then having got the data in your spreadsheet, there are three ways of doing it. You can use the insert table option from the insert ribbon, control T from the keyboard, or use format as table from the home ribbon. Plenty of options. So you can always tell from that, that Microsoft are probably trying to encourage the use of tables. There's a fourth way as well, which we'll come on to later on. So what can we say about tables? Well, when you're creating a table, Excel thinks it ends with a blank row or a blank column. Typically, it will try and work out how big your table is, what, it ex what the extents of your table are. Uh, it can get it wrong, but you do have the option of correcting it, so that's all right. The real, or uh, potentially, the issue is gonna be blank rows because the blank row will cause the table to be come to an end and for large data sets where you can't necessarily see the blank, blank rows, that can be a potential problem. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. You can give tables names. I mean, cells are all automatically named for you, A1, B1, C1, and you can actually override them and, and give them their own little names if you want to. And tables are much the same. When you create a table, Microsoft will create, or Excel will give it a name, very imaginatively, table one, table two, table three, which is not, doesn't tend to be too useful for you, but you can change the name. So generally speaking, you should um, choose your own names for the tables. Um, you can treat tables as a single entity, a single object. And of course, that's part of the, the beauty of tables is that it is a single thing and it all works together. Um, and for almost everything that we're doing today, I'm just gonna treat them on the screen as tables and within tables. But if you're into writing formulas in Excel, there are many formulas now which will accept a table name as um, a parameter to, a, to, a, um, to the formula. So where typically you might have had to provide a range, you can often provide table names. Um, tables have their own ribbon, and we're going to see that. Uh, you can format tables using themes. When you actually create a table, it actually 
gives you a default theme for the table anyway. And, and in all honesty, I tend to just leave the default theme in place, but you've got lots of varieties of changing the name should you want to do so. Um, you can include a totals row at the end of the table. Now, that's a very, co including individual totals, is something that you commonly want to do on, on your data anyway. Um, a table allows you to include a table, a, um, a complete row of totals, and then within each cell within that row, you can pick what kind of total you want, whether you want the sum or the average or whatever. That, that's potentially very useful. Well, which is more equally useful, but perhaps not use no real reason to use it, is that if you subsequently remove that totals row and then add it back in again, it remembers what totals you'd been using. Obviously, if you've removed it to add more rows of data and then put it back in, it will obviously recalculate and, and add include those rows as well. Um, the tables will automatically expand as you add new data, and this is particularly useful um, when we're doing data validation or just adding data in general. The, the table, if you add something to the bottom of the table, it will expand to include the rows. You can also add new columns to the right and it will automatically include them. Uh, unfortunately, if you try to add a new column to the left, they're not automatically included. But as I pointed out before, you have the option of extending, manually extending the, the, um, the dimensions of the table. Okay, first demo, creating tables. Okay, hopefully now we can all see um, this web page which I've gone to. It's from the Met Office and basically it's historical data on um, weather conditions and storm away. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create um, some data by copying all this data down here. Uh, 100 and odd years of data from storm away. Right, so I'm, I'm just going to copy that and I'm going to go to an Excel spreadsheet, which I think is this last one here, which is just an empty Excel spreadsheet. Excel spreadsheet I've opened and I'm just going to paste that in okay and that's just the way I've copied it in okay now on the face of it well it doesn't look very good so certainly I want to get rid of these first few rows because that's not really relevant to the, the tabular type data and equally that row there I don't really need that so on the face of it this looks rather tabular except for the fact if you look at this um, row I mean, or even the, the top row, it's all bunched together. It's all actually in that, in column A. So the first thing we do, we need to fix this. So if I select the whole of column A, this isn't tables at the moment, this is just setting up our data. And then I want to go into uh, data and then use text to columns. If you haven't used this before, it can be very useful. And text to columns will look at what I've selected and say, oh, I think that might be fixed width, but I know better because I know that's limited. And I go into the next screen and it says, oh, I think that would be, must be tab delimited. And I know better because I know it's actually um, space delimited. And I want to treat multiple spaces as consecutive delimiters. And here you can see the lines here are telling me how it's going to split up my data okay click on next and I can say oh I, this column here in black the first one I don't want you to import that because there's nothing in there okay and then I can say finish so now I've imported the data and it now it sort of looks a lot more like a table now because you know I've got rows and columns and headings and all this sort of stuff but in fact this is just a collection of cells to get this into a table um, I've got the options of I can use the table here or I can go to the home tab and say format as table. Um, I think if I come out here, it'll think that one cell is a table. If I'm somewhere in my data and say format as table or insert table, that tends to be the one I use, or tells you there you can use control T as well. Okay, so I'm just going to click on that and say, see what it says. <clears throat> and you can see here, it actually works out how big this table is, A1, up there, right down to the bottom, 
one seven seven three. I happen to know there's no space in this, so we're okay here. And you've got the option saying um, it guesses that there's headers in this table, and so it has a clicked checked. I can uncheck that if I want to. Notice that the, it, it includes this apparently blank row here, and that's because I don't know if you noticed when I was copying it, but right down at the bottom, there are some some of the bottom rows actually have something in that um, column H. Okay, so that looks good. I'm going to say OK. So here we can see the first example of the formatting. This is the default color scheme of, of, of a table. And it has done the, the striped um, coloring, colorings is really just to help the data stand out more. I said that um, there are, in fact, table options here for um, the table settings, which comes up automatically. And you can see here, down here, the table styles, which you can change to your heart's delight, OK? Like I said, I tend to just stick with the um, the, the the standard one as it comes up. If, don't worry about it. Up here, you can see where it says table one. As I said, the first table, it calls it table one. You can change that. So let's just, we'll just call it stone away. I would recommend you change the names to something meaningful for your tables. Okay, so then we have the table itself, and one of the things you may have noticed is all of the columns have their own automatic filters put on there. Now these filters are exactly the same filters as you could put on yourself manually one at a time if you wanted to in in non-table um, formats. But um, I think it's quite convenient having them there because they tend to get used quite a lot. The other thing, which is very clever, I think, is that if I am scrolling this table, watch what happens as I scroll down to these headings, A to H. They get replaced by the table column headings, which is really quite convenient. But the little things I can do is if I want to select the whole table, I can use Control A, and that will select the whole table should I need to do that. Um, I said if I get if I control home and control n, still work the same way to do for anything else. So control n takes me down to the bottom of the table. And things to notice here is um, if I start adding data into here, like two o two one three whatever. Okay. As soon as I start doing that, the table expands, and you can tell immediately by the colouring of it to include the row I've started there. And also, at the end, on the bottom right of the table, you may be able to see this little inverse L shape, and in that indicates the end of the table. I'll try making that bigger, so you can see it there. Whoops. So you see the end of the table with that little L shape. And you can select that, and you can drag it, and that's how you can change the size of the table, certainly in this direction diagonally like that and down and what have you. Um, I'm just going to cut out that data now, back to where we were. So this now is in there. I'll just delete that. If you want to add new columns, I'm just going to go Control Home to get to the top. Uh, oh, notice this column one has been named by Excel because there wasn't, although it knows my table has columns, because I told it there wasn't a column name for it. So it's called a column one. So I can change that myself if I want to. If I want to add a new column to the right, I can just say um, new column, new call. And as soon as I hit enter, I get a complete new column add, added to my table. If I wanted to put a formula in there, um, again, I select that first cell and I can just say, I don't know, equals one, very primitive sort of formula. And if I hit enter, it will automatically propagate down to the end of the table and it'll stop at the end of the table. I know you used to be able to, well, you, you obviously you still can. If it's not a table, you can use the little uh, drag bar down there and tell it to do that. But it will do this automatically. Don't really want that column, so I'm going to delete it. So um, we can think, just go through my little checklist here. We can use text to columns. We've done that. We've created it. I've told you three ways of doing it. Selecting the whole table is Control-A. The table design ribbon, we can see um, 
if, oh, by the way, if, if I go out of the table, I lose the table design ribbon. It only appears when you're in the table itself. I click on it, we see the various things we do. We've covered the style, sort of. Um, first, uh, header row is there by default. Banded rows is there by default. You can actually switch that off if you want to. But like I said, I tend to leave it on. And you can see here, I've got total row. I can click that on, and it comes down here and gives me totals. Um, it seems to have automatically counted them as um, text. So that is going to be a sum. But if, if I want to do um, my own little one down here for whatever, I can click on the down arrow and I can pick any of the ones I, I may want to do. So all, all the usual contenders are in there. Okay. Um, if you don't want that, you just switch it off. Uh, the filter buttons, again, they're on by default. Uh, we can export and in, in, include slices, which we'll do much later on. We can summarize it with a pivot table, which we'll sort of be doing later on as well. Um, if you want to get rid of your table, there's an option to say convert to range. And you can um, just go back to having a non-table if you want to. And we've got the resize table there. If I click on that, it comes up and effectively just allows me to manually um, either change these values here, or I can use the, the outline type thing, as you can do on formulas. So there's lots of things you can do manipulating um, the table if you need to. So back to the slides. Advantages of the tables are the formatting. Personally, I think the formatting of the tables is, is only useful because it helps the, the, the data stand out. Lots of numeric data, it helps if you band the rows and make it stand out. Automatic filters, yes, well, you can do it without that, but they're nice to have as well. Um, the keep column names when scrolling, that, that can be very, very useful if you're trying to add data in and you can't remember what column you're onto and things like that. You can add rows, you can add columns, you can add totals. So they're, they're very flexible, uh, but no matter how you add things or take things away, you still only have one table there. Right, creating table the fourth way. Now, this is where um, you're going to import a CSV or a tab delimited table, um, data set or whatever. And we're, we're going to use this, or the way to use this is using the get data from the data tab. Um, in most cases, unless you're creating your own small amounts of data, um, you're probably, this is probably the most common way of getting data into an Excel spreadsheet and making it into a table. Um, if you've done this sort of thing before and you said, oh, well, hang on, surely I just have to double click a CSV file and it'll load it up automatically. Well, that is true, but there are a couple of problems with doing that, which I'm hopefully going to show you in a minute. So let, let's create some tables. Um, I'm not going to start with the Twitter data, I think. I'm going to start with... Test data one CSV. So I'm going to start off by just double clicking test data one CSV. Okay, so that is me starting up, double clicking, and you can see it's imported everything from from the um, there, but it it's got a gap in there and it doesn't leave it as a table. It just imports the data as is. Um, if I want to create in, that into a table, I'll use con, Control T, and you can see here that yes, it's recognize table headers, but notice how it stopped at the blank line. Okay. So that's one downside of having of doing this. You don't get a table automatically and it doesn't necessarily well well I suppose the blank line would have occur anyway. Um, if I want to do I could select all of it and then say insert table and then it will create a table of all of it. Okay. And it's up to me to deal with the blank line. You can have blank lines in tables. It just won't, it will use a blank line to stop the length of the table if it has to. So that's how you can double click on a CSV file. But what we don't want to do is, we don't want to save that. What we really want to do is create it from scratch. So I'm going to create an empty spreadsheet again starting from scratch 
And the better way to do it is to use data from text CSV. Okay, so I'm still going to effectively um, import a CSV file um, and find it. Do, 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 do. And the one I want to use is this UK flattened one CSV. And what this data is, if I click on it and say import, it's data, it's Twitter data, which I've flattened from the JSON into a standard CSV type format. Okay, so I've got dates created at, I've got user ID strings and various other things, uh, most of which we're not really terribly interested in. It's really just to show that we can import it. And when we import it like this, again, it will make a some, it will actually read the first 200 rows of the data. And then from that, it will conclude, oh yes, it's probably got table headers up here. It's comedy limited. Notice this, this isn't based on the fact it's called .csv. It actually looks at the data and works it out from the data. And the encoding is by default, it'll be UTF-8 for a, for this type of file. That's probably a safe encoding, if you, certainly if you're using social media type data. Um, what is a bit odd about this is this ID string. This is meant to be a Twitter ID string. Um, let me just show you what this file looks like when I haven't got it inside um, Excel. If I go to this UK data flatten one, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this in a text editor called VS Code. It's just a fancy text editor, not Excel. The important thing is not Excel. And the other important thing or useful thing about it is it has facilities to nicely color code CSV files. Okay. So you can see here, I've got the dates with a time on it. I've got that number, which you saw down, that's the same because it's all come from the same person. And this yellow here is actually a tweet ID. Uh, a, a, yes, the tweet ID. And so they are very long numbers. And if you compare that with what I had in, appear to have here, it's changed that to, um, scientific notation, okay? Now what I want to do is I want to try and preserve the full length of that string rather than have it like that. So rather, I could just say load and it would start here and load it all in, but I would have problems with this. So what I want to do is say load to, um, oops, no, I don't want to do that. Let me cancel that for a minute. Try that. Import. What I want to say, rather than loading at this point, I want to say transform the data. And the reason I want to do this is for two reasons. I want to show you that, that these strings are, are being imported the way they were looking before. But if I go up here, and this is already, ID, um, it's got one, two, three, so it thinks it's a whole number. So the problem with, with just doing it like this is that I'm gonna lose those long digit numbers. It's gonna save this or put it into my spreadsheet in that format. And if I subsequently save it, let me just load that up. I'm doing this a bit backwards, but bear with me. You can see here, I've got these ID strings here in scientific notation, e to the plus 18, showing the very big numbers. Now I can select that column in the usual way and say um, format cells, and I can say I want it in number, number, here's zero. And if I do that, yes, it made it nice long numbers, but you see at the end, everything is zeros. It's because it had already lost the full um, set of digits and it's now approximating to what it, what it should be. And that's what would happen if I had just double clicked it and uh, double clicked the CSV file as well. So let's uh, go onto another sheet. I'm gonna insert, drag the same one in. Only this time I'm gonna do it properly. I'm gonna say import. And instead of here saying based on first 200 rows, I'm gonna to say 
don't try and detect the data types. The rest of it, I can leave the same. So the immediate effect of this is that it, just, it can no longer recognize the fact that I've got headers, say. So now when I transform the data, everything is going to be treated. You see these little ABCs, everything is treated as a string. But at the same time, I do have my full numbers in there. So if I take this column, I'm, this column, and I say change this into whole numbers, or rather leave that as uh, as it is as a uh, a text string, I can use this to promote those first rows into headers. Okay. Now the trouble A is this now change tends to think this is a string, um, a number now. So what I want to do is select that and say it is in fact text. I'm going to replace that. And you can see now it's text because it's left aligned and I've retrieved all of the data, the full values, okay? And if I say load and close, close and load rather, it will load that in there. And you notice whenever you use this method, using the data import method. When it loads it up, it loads it up as a table automatically. For some reason, using a slightly different theme, a green theme, but there you go, it's loaded as a table. And you can see here on my ID string, because I explicitly said these are strings rather than numbers, I haven't lost any data. Whereas these ones here have, have been lost. So, that is one very good reason why you should always import using um, data import. The other advantages are that it automatically puts it into a table for you. And the third advantage is that rather than having a file called something something dot CSV, it actually copies this into a new Excel spreadsheet. So this is just called book two now. My original CSV file hasn't been touched. I've read it in, but it's not touched. And this is a good thing to do when you're using data. Never touch, never risk damaging your, your original data. So it helps you with that as well. Okay. Um, that covers all of that. So back to this. Let me just close that. Come up and need that one again. And I'll go back to the slides if I can. Right, so double click, uh, don't do that. Use the data tab and then you don't lose your data. Um, tables and data validation, it might be considered a little bit of a digression, but because um, Excel does have quite powerful data validation options, um, but you need to set it up. And if you set it up, you're better off setting it up with tables, um, as we shall see. Okay, so here we have very simple um, bit of a couple of tables I've set up. This table down here, um, did I give it a name? Which I've called items, is me adding data to my table, okay? And this has already been set up. And what I've done is um, if I go to the end of this row here, the last data entry in there, I'm not going to put anything in there. Um, I've set it up so it automatically gives me a new row number. I've got data validation there. I've got data validation there, but I'm not going to use them. If I come down to here, oops, I haven't got data validation on that one. Don't know why it hasn't. Let's go back up to this one. Data validation here, and what I'm doing is I'm using a list here of colors. And this list, red down to indigo, is this list here, red down to indigo. And so I'm forced to pick one of those colors. I try to put anything in there in an object. On this one, this appears to look the same, and I've got red down to indigo. Um, but the difference A is that this one is, let me just shorten that table a little bit. This one is purely based on this list of cells, whereas the validation on this one is based on this table column. Options is, is, a, is a table, you can see the color coding and, and what have you, the 
filter, what have you. So what happens here is I can pick one of them in the same way. So uh, they seem to be the same, but then I realize, oh, hang on, I haven't got violet in here. And it's not in that list either. So what happens if I add violet onto that list? Oops, and violet onto my table. On the table, you can see straight away that the table's been extended to include violet. Here, well, you can't tell it hasn't done anything, but if I go back up to my list on, on this one, I still don't have violet. If I go back to my one down here, I've now got violet included because the way it's been set up, it knows this list is coming from a table. And when you extend the table, it's still coming from the same part of the table. Okay. So I'll just show you down here briefly how this was set up on some of them. I won't, I won't put the validation on most of them, but certainly on the, the rainbow color, which works with the table. In fact, rainbow color on the table. Let me just show you how they were set up. Um, if I click on the green for the color, and go to, um, oops, oops, no, data, data validation here. If I click on that, because I've already got set up here, this is going to come up and show me how it's been set up. Yes. Now, when, you, when you're setting it up for new, you just get a blank screen here and you can select how you want these things to work, picking the ones you want. Okay. So for this one, I've picked green. A big point, I picked a list, and then the source of that list, I could manually put them in, um, the actual text in there. But typically, you're going to pick a range, which you're allowed to do. And here, you, I can see I said L2 down to L7, right? And violet, of course, is in L8. So although I've added violet at the end here, this isn't going to pick it up. If I go to the rainbow color and look at the same thing. Oops. You can see here it's exactly the same. It's a list, but here I've said the source is a list called rainbow. Okay. Now the table itself isn't called rainbow. It's just the list which is called rainbow. And how did I get that list? Let me just cancel that. I can create a list um, by going into formulas, name manager, and this has shown me a list of my tables um, and lists. So rainbow is a list. And you can see at the bottom here, how did I get lists? It is equal to colors, which is the table name. And then within colors, the, the column called options. Okay, and it's because it's done this way. Yes, you have to have a list of some kind, but because this list is defined in terms of the table colors, it means that when I extend that um, table, it's automatically picking up the new values. Okay, so the, the moral of the story is um, always use tables when you're using. Um, pick lists in this manner, because then if you need to add something new to it, you don't have to go back and change your formula. Um, the reason I'm going to show you something down here, I'm going to do the same thing down here. Um, I'm just going to add it to this rainbow column here. Notice there's, there's no validation on this at the moment. But if I go to um, data validation, so here I get the validation screen in its normal empty settings. And I'm going to say list. And then here, I'm just going to do exactly what I had before, um, equals rainbow, and say OK. And now you see the little drop-down arrow here, and I've got my list of colors in there. Now, the reason I want to do that on, on a blank list or a blank row is that if I want to, if this was data input, I would have my columns like that. And what I want to do is extend it to the row covering where I put all my data validation steps in. And that is what I would want to turn into a table. OK, yes, it's got header rows. I'm going to say OK. And now when I go down here, I've got the validation here. 
And when I tab to go on, to automatically takes me down to the next uh, beginning of the next row, extending the table as it goes. If I now click on there, it's automatically got my validation in there. So the idea is you put your columns in, you put your data validation in, then you create the table, and then you can have data. I've only done it for that one thing, but you can have data validation all the way across the board. And as you add new rows, it automatically includes the data validation that you might require. Okay. So the next sort of obvious question is, well, okay, that, that's okay. I'm validating my own data and you know creating my own data input but we've already said that in most cases you don't go around creating your own data in this way you import it from a csv or something like that so the question is if i import it from a csv do i still have the data validation facilities available to me well to look at the slides For bulk input, can it be done? Yes, no, yes, no, yes. Now the question is, is it really yes or did I just run out of room on the slide? Okay, so we'll have a little look at that using a different data set. This is a data set which I have, I've already imported it. Um, I've made it into a table. And down here, much as I had before, I've got a little table uh, which I'm using for data va validation. Okay. Um, ideally, if this was for real, I would not have this data validation table on this same tab. I'd have it on a separate tab somewhere. This is just for clarity for the demonstration. So the question is, um, can I do data validation on data which is already in there? Well, the answer is sort of yes, because if I select this column observation, say, and go to data, data validation, data validation, uh, list, I've already got it on, in fact, list, um, and I was going to do it exactly the same way. I say a list, and I'm calling observation, which is a list from this table here. Okay, I'm going to apply that. And on the face of it, well, cold, that's in my list, so that's not, nothing wrong with that data. So on the face of it, it doesn't really stand out. And if I just whiz down here, if I was whizzing too quickly, you might miss this entry here and this entry here. Okay. Now, in fact, just doing the data validation does actually mark them with the little green triangle in the um, top corner. As you can see there, and the little asterisk when you go next to it, exclamation mark, and it will tell you um, if I click on that, it will tell me data validation error. The problem with this method is it, it's not very clear, very easy to spot. Now you can sort of make it better by saying, oops, no, by saying data validation, circle invalid data. Oops, I should have done that for the whole thing. Oh, no, I haven't. So now it circles it. Now, again, that, that's making those stand out. But again, if that was row um, 96,000 and not line 69, you're going to have trouble spotting that. So ideally, what you'd want to do is use some different method. So one of the things you can do, if, if we're just checking the humidity, rather than um, using the data validation, you can instead um go to the home tab and do conditional formatting so if i use conditional formatting um new rule and i can say let's say format only values that are above or below oh maybe options here cell value between um say zero is temp humidity no no between 65 and 75 oops 65 and 75 okay so that, that's a very similar sort of arrangement to when we're doing the um, data validation and i should have colored that let me just do that again um new rule So 
Something that I contain. 65 and 75. Um, and I'm going to format that with a color. Oops, fill red. Okay. Hmm, what did he do? Let's try this again. Ooh, here's his demonstrations. New rule. Only cells that can contain between. Sixty-five and seventy. Format red. Okay, okay. So now they're highlighted. Okay, and, and the advantage of them being highlighted in this way is that if I go down to the filter, I can actually filter by color, so I can make all of the errors come to the top. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Just moving on to the observation ones, where it's a bit different um, because the, this is a list of names. Now, we know this is already set up, and we can't do it in quite the same way. But what I can do is I can insert a column. Yeah, insert a column. Notice how it went back to the top for me automatically to do that. Insert a column. And in here, I'm going to use a little formula, which hopefully... I've saved some way because it's complicated. This is the formula I'm going to use. Control C. I'm going to put the formula in there. Before I hit enter, I'll just read this to you. So count if is just a standard function um, formula. But you can see here I'm using table to open brackets, square brackets, observation type, which is effectively the column from this table. And then I want to check check whether or not this little square bracket in the at sign means the value in my table, current table, in the observation column. That's how you ref can refer to um, cells in, in tables. Now, having done that, if I just hit enter, oops, cancel that, that didn't seem wrong. Data. Validation. Data. Okay. Let's, let's do this again using a row on this side. Um, insert a row. Add to my table. Let me just delete that. It just occurs to me I've actually got observation error here. <coughs> oh, okay. Fortunately, here's one I've done before. Um, so you can see in here um, that I've created a, a column observation error. I've put that formula in, and when I use that formula, typically, if everything is okay, I'm going to get a one in there, and if it's not, I'll get a zero in there. So now, having done that, I can use my normal filtering and say, well, one is okay, so get rid of that, and just show me the zeros. And th that way, you can bring up all of the errors um, in, in the observation column. Okay? So... I would, if you're looking to do validation on, on bulk files like that, it's sometimes better to use data validation, um, uh, not use data validation, but to use either formatting or your own little formula. Okay, next thing we want to look at is table relationships. Um, what a table, table relationship is, it's the connecting of tables that have something in common. And the two types we're going to look at are appending tables. And this is where the tables have a common set of columns. And we want to um, concatenate the rows of the tables together. We're going to look at merge a bit later on when we do pivot tables. And we're going to see there that this is where you have a, a, a single column, which is common in usage to two tables, and you can combine them together based on those. So when you append tables, you get the same, typically, 
you get the same number of columns but more rows because you're adding a table onto a table if you like at the bottom um, and when you merge two tables you typically get a table um, with more columns but the same number of rows because you're adding new columns from the second table onto it but again this is far better done showing you the demonstrations of these of appending tables and we're, we're going to do appending tables first because this is the, the easiest one and to show so what we have here are four tiny little tables tables a b a d b and c that was just my naming convention gonna write okay and what i want to do is i want to add table d onto the bottom of table a well, if they're nice and small like this, what I could do is um, use Control A to select all of table D, and I could drag it and drop it there, and you can see that table A is automatically being expanded to do that. So that's very quick and easy if you've only got small little tables, and of course, all the columns are right, okay? But what happens if I wanted to add all the four tables together, okay? And you can see here that table B has an extra column, table C also has an extra column and got these switched around the other way, okay? So can we add all these four tables together? Well, rhetorical question, of course we can. And where we're gonna do it, we're gonna use the data, get data, combine queries. A uh, little word note on, on the use of the word queries. Um, queries means tables in this context. Let me just, and merge we're gonna do later on, I'm gonna do the append for now. Append tables. And you get this little dialogue up to say, oh, two tables, three or more tables. Well, I want three or more tables. And these are my available tables. And oh dear, table D is missing. So the question is, why is table D missing? And the reason is that behind the scenes, when you before you do this, all of your tables have got to be put into what's called the data model in Excel. And I've already done it for A, B, and C, but I haven't done it for D, so I can show you. So let me just cancel that. Go to table D, and I can say, table from um, get and transform data from table range. And when I click on that, it brings up this thing called the Power Query Editor, okay? And all I have to do is do very nothing much. Um, it's already got that table selected. It says table D there, that's okay. So I'm just gonna say load and close two. And this brings up this little import data dialog. And the reason, the only reason I wanted to bring this is I've got to say add it to the data model because I need it in there. But equally, I don't really need a table because I've already got a table. So I'm just going to say only create connection. And there we now have on this left hand side, I've now got tables A, B, C, and D. Um, so back to where we started from get data, combine queries, append three or more tables, A, B, C, or D. I'm just gonna add them all in. And click on okay. And you can see there, that is the result it's gonna give me. It's probably gonna be easy if I do the load, uh, close and load two. And the reason I want to say, I just want to control where it's gonna go down there, say okay. And now you can see this imp uh, created table of A, B, C, and D. Things to notice about it, it doesn't care if you've got characters in there or not. It puts all of the columns in the right order, including D and E, which weren't in the first two tables. It has noticed that in table C, A and B are swapped over and put them in the right where they so this gives you a lot of flexibility for tables which you're importing which are supposedly similar tables but in fact aren't quite similar tables okay so it's a lot better than just trying to i mean you can imagine the difficulty you'd have if you try to just drag and drop this little table onto the bottom of a or d yeah 
or even or or any other combination. Okay, so appending tables, if you do it using this method, it's going to cover most of the, the common type problems that you're likely to, to come across. Okay, uh, let me just close that one. Don't need that one anymore. Back to the appending tables. So now we're going to move on to pivot tables. Um, I'm going to come back to do the, the merging of tables um, as part of pivot tables. So what is it? It's used to summarize data, and it's used to convert long format to wide format. <coughs> so a simple example here. Um, not that one. Store pivot. So what I've got on this spreadsheet is a table here. Did I name the table? No, I didn't. I should have named that something. Table one, it's called. But what I've got is typical sort of data sales type data stuff. Okay. And it's in a table. And what I wanted to do was create a pivot table. Now, I've already done that. We'll go through making that in a minute. But what I wanted to show you is the way um, it has converted the data. So down here, I've got north and I've got south, which is the region. For north and south, I've got what stores occur in that region, A and B and A and C and D for the other one. Yeah. And then for the item column, the values in the item columns or the unique values have in fact become rows. Uh, column headers rather okay so this is the notion of taking this long column and make it into a wide set of values and then within the, the body of of this i have got the values of which is in fact give you the sum of the values in here so for here we can see um for b for bikes, you can see down here, I've got two B bikes, 200 in each, and here I've got the sum of them, okay? So that, that's the explaining the long and the wide sort of thing, and what the basic format of the table, of the of this is. How do you create it? Well, I'm going to, um, I'll tell you what, let's create another one. Let's kill that for a moment. In here, I can say, Anyway, in the table, I'm going to say insert pivot table. Um, normally, I would do these on separate worksheets, but I want to do this in an existing worksheet um, just down here below that one I had. And I'm going to say OK. And what happens here, you get this little emptiness down here. And on the left hand, on the right hand side here, we've got the pivot table fields automatically comes up. You can switch these off, switch them back on using this field list up here. Notice we've got our own little tabs up here, pivot table analyze and pivot table design. Design is just much for changing themes. This is where you do all your work. And what you do is you get a list of all of the all of the um, columns from our table and you can put them where you want to. So if I was to recreate this one up here, what I've got is I've got a region um, as, a, as a rows. So I've got my north and south. Within the region, I've got my stores, A and B. For the columns, I've got item. So I now get the different columns going across the top there. And then um, for the body of it, I want to put the value. And by default for values, if it's numeric, you get the sum of the values, okay? If I was interested in how many of each item, I could left click here, say value field settings and change this to count, for example, yeah and it changes them to count. 
So that is the basics of how you create a pivot table. You can see that it's summarizing the data in various different ways and why you might want to do that. The other thing you, you might want to do is having, <coughs> excuse me, having got the pivot table, you might actually want to export it. And you can do this, uh, so I make it look like a flat CSV file. Um, now this works, <laughs> I'll go through the part of doing this, but not all of this. I'll explain why not all of this. If I select it in my pivot table and go on to my um, pivot table design option up here, and then we've got report layout. And if I say it's default is showing compact form. If I say showing tabular form, then you can see here, each of these um, values now get its own row as opposed to up here where they're sharing the same row. Okay, that's stage one. Stage two, report layout is to repeat all item labels. And that has the effect of filling in all these norths and souths. And the third thing I want to do is get rid of these subtotals. Do not show subtotals. So now I have pretty much got um, a basic table. Um, and I can copy that if I use Control A to select it, Control C to copy it. If I go onto a, oops, a new sheet and do copy values, you can see there how I've got a very basic table. And that, the idea is that, that I can now export into a CSV file. Um, the other thing that you may have wanted to do, I'll go back to my original one, is rather than having all these blank values, you may want to put them as zero. And you can do that by, if you right mouse click and say pivot table options, I can say for empty cell cells show zero or whatever you want to show. And I'll fill all them in for you. Okay, and then you can export that. Okay, it's moving on quickly onto the last step. They're, they're the basics of how you set up a spreadsheet. You can have things uh, more than once. So if I wanted um, item, I've got the um, I've got the count of the value. If I drag value down there again, I now get the sum of value and the count of the value for each one. So I can have the same item in there and I can use different simulations in there. So average, whatever you want, usual sort of things. Okay. Uh, nearly, nearly finished. So for the last demonstration, this is where we're gonna do the, the merging of um, tables. I'm actually gonna use a, a data set, data service, um, data set, SN7613, which if you haven't used it before, it's a census training data set, not last Monday's census, but the one before, I imagine. It's got about half a million records in it, 18 variables, and all the data is numeric. And it's mainly represent, the numeric data is mainly representations of categorical data. So for this, I want to show you first, when you download this data set, service data set, it's hard to say fast, um, part, uh, in addition to getting the data, you actually get um, a code book or data dictionary, which explains what all of the variables are and what they mean and what values they can take, okay? Um, essential reading before you try to do any work on the data set. So from that, um, what I've done in my in my Excel spreadsheet here, I have created a few little tables in advance of some of those variables. So I've got the age variable, age GPT, and I've just made into a table, the value one is not to 50 and so on. And I've did the same for economic activity, health and region, okay? Because we're gonna need them later on. Now, what I want to do is actually import that, the data set itself, which I don't have at the moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to data 
and I'm going to say get data from CSV as we did before. This data is hidden in here. This is the file you download. It actually downloads as a tab file, but it doesn't matter. I've renamed it. I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to say import. And then we get up this little dialogue um, or screen saying, what do you want to do? In this case, I don't need to make any changes to, to, to this because it all looks pretty good to me. So all I really want to do is load this in. But I'm just not going to say load. I'm going to say load to. And here we get our little import data tab coming up, uh, window coming up. And here, I am going to want to put this in the data model because I'm going to need it in the data model to do my merging of tables later on. Um, and all I really want this for is to um, create a pivot table. So in fact, I don't actually actually have to import the table. I just want to keep a, a link to where the data is. Okay. So with that, only create connection and add this table to the data model. If I click on OK, it will go away and start importing the data. And you can see here the progress it's making um, is about just over 500,000 rows, I think, to bring in. And when it finishes, in a minute, now, um, I'll, I'll tell you while it's doing this, one of the advantages of using the data model only option, as I've done here, is that um, if, if this, it's got 569,000 rows, if it had 5 million rows, I wouldn't have been able to import it as a table into Excel because Excel is limited to a million rows, but it would still let me import it into the data model. So if you've got a very large tables and you only really want to do the summaries of it, you can put it in the data model and still do the summaries. Okay, I just hover over that. You can see the little options I get there for refreshing it, deleting it, and various other little things. And it gives you a very little um, small snapshot of what the data looks like. But we're going to want a bigger look at the data. I'm going to go to Manage Data Model. And this brings up um, what's called Power Pivot. And in here, it's effectively, as the name suggests, it allows you to see what's in your data model. And at the moment, we've only got our one little table down at the bottom here. This is, the, and this is the data. And you can do various things on this data from here, uh, which we don't really want to do. All we really want to do is create a pivot table. So I'm going to click on Create Pivot Table, and I'm going to say it in a new worksheet to keep it out of the way. And this looks this bit exactly the same as we had before. Down here, it looks a bit different because I've actually got my um, data model table in here. You can tell by the little um, disk symbol in the corner here saying it's in the data model. And it also recognizes that I've got my four other tables down here. Yeah. So if let's start off with our data, um, creating our pivot table in the same way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have health down side there. I'm going to have age in the columns. And then for the values, I'm actually going to use purse ID. Now, purse ID is the identifier, the unique identifier. And it's, again, like everything else in, in the data set, it's a number. So if I drag that down to values, it'll automatically give me the sum, which doesn't actually make a lot of sense. So what I really want here, I want to change that and make that into count. And then it sort of makes more sense because you can see down here my grand total, 569,741, which is the number of records in the file. Um, I can change these um, labels up here into something more meaningful like um, age group, Row labels are call health. Okay. And on the face of it, that is the end of our little pivot table. The problem is um, it leaves a lot to be desired because, well, what does this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mean across the top and minus nine to five on, on the columns? Rather than having those numbers, what we really want to know is what they are representing. So I've got health down here. So if I go back to my other set of tables here, 
and find health. I can, oh, oh yes, one is very good health and, and so on and so forth. But it would be nice if I could have these labels actually in here, yeah? So how do I get them in there? Well, going back to our pivot table fields, you may have noticed that my age table has been included for me to use, value and label. And what I want to do is use the label. So if I put the label in the row there, it adds it in. I can also take out the health one because I don't want that. Oops, and I've done that the wrong way around. That's age group. I should have put that one up there. Let me just put um, health back in there for a minute. Okay. So on the face of it, um, I've now got these looking a lot better, but something doesn't quite add up in that all of these totals at the bottom are all saying the same thing. And <clears throat> if that isn't enough as a clue to something wrong, I've got this little box up here saying, oh, relationship between tables may be needed. Well, it's not a maybe, it, it is, yes, we need to create a, a, um, a relationship. So what we do is click on create, the dialog box comes up and the way we do this is that the first table is um, effectively the table we're making the spreadsheet from which in our case is the one in the data model the census one the column in brackets foreign this is the, the column which is equals or it, we're going to equate with a column in our other table which is the primary one so the column we want here um, this is age I'm looking at is age group and the related table is my age group table and the related column here is going to be the value because it's the value of those which are recorded in the um the census table i'm going to click ok and now you can see ah oh, this looks better now i've got proper val values down there so now what we're to do is exactly the same thing for health health table down here um, i'm going to put the label in because that's the text that we want to see get rid of that and now we've got the same problem again very clear in this case and i'm going to have to create another relationship um, the top line is again table is going to be the same there here i'm looking at health here i want my health table and here i want the value Okay, so now I've got something readable, which is a lot better. Um, age groups, yes, they all go up in the right way. The slight problem I've now got is the ordering down here. Bad health, fair health, good health, no code, very bad health, very good health. The problem is that um, I, can, I can sort these, but as they're text, I can only sort them ascending or descending order. Okay. So what we need to do, if we want them in a, a more reasonable order, we can go back to our lookups and go down to health. And I'm going to add a new column here and say sort by. It's a table, so it gets added automatically. And down, the, down here, I'm just going to say one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So I've added that into my table, and this is the way I ideally like to sort it. If I go back down, I've still got my data model open down here. You can see here, um, health one, no difference there. It hasn't changed that. But what I do have is an option for, to refresh. If I click down there, I can say refresh. I don't want to, I can refresh everything if I want to, but that'll go back and try and load that half a million rows of tables. So I just want to refresh the table I'm on and it says yes it's done that six rows transferred and in a minute um, I can see my sort by column appearing in the data um, in the data model um, what I didn't point out is that <clears throat> as I use the, as I create the relationships it automatically adds a copy into the data model for me I don't have to manually do that so now having got that in, what I want to do is go back to my label column and up here I have an option called sort by column. 
sort by column. And what I'm saying is when I've got the label column, I want you to actually sort it by the value. Uh, that'd be part of the sort by column. Okay. Click on OK. And then hopefully, if I now go back into my spreadsheet, you can see I've now got these in the order I think I would probably want them to be displayed in. And just very finally, um, from my table here, I just want to um, insert a chart. I'm going to go for the line chart. That's just a basic line chart. And what um, you, you can mess around with this as much as like, but one of the things is can make it look quite nice is if you if it's not too bulky you can add the data onto the bottom like that and then this table tells you everything you need to know and the only final thing i want to do is we haven't used this little filters option up here so going back to um uh to region i'm going to put in there the region label area name and when i said oh no another create relationship so again um this is always going to be the same one here i'm looking for region at the bottom there related table is going to be region and i'm interested in again the value because that's what that's what they have in common. Okay, so that goes away and that's all right. And now I've got the label area name up there. And the final thing I want to do is to insert a slicer for that final um, region label area name. Oops, click that. Which I'm going to put down here. It's sort of make it a little bit bigger. Various thing you can do with slices, but I only wanted to show you this because this is currently all coloured in, indicating that I've got all of, I'm showing all of the data on this table or on this graph. But I can um, do them individually if I want to to show the various health status against age for different age groups, or I can put them all together, have multiple ones if I wanted to. Okay, so that's our little dashboard, which is now, I think, the end.